What's cracking, guys? Omar Esau here, back with another video, back from vacation. Happy New Year! If you notice, the shit stash is gone. As I told you guys uh, in the comment section below, I wanted to get a hundred kilos. I decided not to shave until I got it. Got that thing. Got a whole bunch of new goals for 2017. But that's not the point of this video. Got a lot of cool things to share with you. Check back every day, new uploads. This video is a very important one. It's going to be more informative than my other videos on this topic, more in depth, uh, talking about the different details when it concerns muscles, trying to build uh, your muscles, and then strength, how they're correlated. And kind of, it's that question of the chicken or the egg, which came first, where a lot of people will say, you know, in order to get bigger, you need to get stronger, or they'll also say the same statement or a similar statement that building more muscle has more potential to increase your strength. So how does it really work? And there's a lot of questions when you think about it, right? Like one, why do you see some jack people that aren't very strong at all? Why do you see some individuals that are very strong that don't have a lot of muscle? Why sometimes when you put two people on the exact same program, they don't get the same results despite starting from the exact same base? So there's a lot of questions. Eric Helms is the guest today. He's incredibly intelligent. He's going to break this down. We're going to try and keep this succinct. If you like this series or the style of videos featuring Eric, make sure to like the damn video. I think it's about eight minutes his part. He did his best to try and uh, give as concise of an explanation while keeping it as informative as possible. There's a lot of references in the description. I think there's over a dozen for those that are interested and just kind of want to learn more and get into the nitty gritty details. But without further ado, let's talk about building muscle and strength, their correlation, and what really matters. What's going on everybody? Eric Helms from 3D Muscle Journey back. Omar, thanks for having me once again. Happy holidays, and today I wish to bring you the gift of knowledge. So, today we're going to be talking about the relationship between hypertrophy and strength. A lot of people are confused out there. You'll hear people say that you have to get stronger and train for strength to get bigger, as long as you're getting stronger in the moderate rep range with a group of movements that train all of the body's muscles. That's the way you get bigger. Other people are saying that training for strength and hypertrophy are totally different. Hypertrophy really has almost no impact on strength, and these two types of training are distinct. Well, the reality is that both groups have it a little bit wrong, and we're going to try to get in there, clarify things, and try to give you some practical recommendations to take home. So first off, while it is true that you want progressive overload and training to get bigger, it is not gaining strength that makes you bigger. Rather, getting bigger is a component of strength, but it's one of many components. If you were to look over a lifter's training career, starting at the first time he picked up a weight, moving into his novice, intermediate, and advanced stages, you will see that one of that these different contri uh, contributing factors are more dominant in different stages. In the earliest stages, it's about motor learning. Remember that strength is always expressed through a skill, through a movement pattern. Squatting, benching, all these movements, they take some skill to know how to do. Strength is not just an attribute of the body, it is also a skill. So motor learning is the first thing that's going to result in huge strength gain initially. Being able to go from barely benching your body weight or squatting your body weight rather towards eventually squatting two times your body weight takes becoming good at squatting. Likewise, there are other neurological adaptations that occur uh, that allow us to be less inhibited and express more of our strength, increase things like rate coding, uh, and also increasing coordination between and within muscle groups that basically result in our ability, our body's ability to actually recruit the muscle it has to produce force. Uh, these are very uh, dominating in the early stages that result in rapid gains in strength. That's not to say you aren't seeing hypertrophy early on, it's just not as large of a proportion of what is resulting in the strength. Then after these initial uh, neurological and motor learning adaptations happen, we start to see increases in muscle efficiency. Uh, this is what's called an increase in normalized muscle force, which just means that per unit area of muscle, uh, you will see an increased uh, force production, meaning the muscle is getting more efficient. Uh, this is thought to happen, theorized in two ways. Uh, one is that there's increased packing density of the myofibrils inside the muscle fiber, so each muscle fiber has more contractile tissue, and also that there's increased force transmission between fibers, uh, that there is potentially these lateral connections that are occurring within the muscle so that uh, the muscle is more efficient at transmitting force and therefore the whole muscle ends up being stronger. 
Uh, this is more in the kind of intermediate stage where this is a little more dominant. Of course, all this is happening at the same time. It continues to. And then finally, as that muscle efficiency and those early stage neurological adaptations uh, have, have occurred in their primary sense, hypertrophy starts to become a greater proportion of your strength gains as far as it being a major contributor. Not the sole contributor, but it becomes more important as you advance training age and you've made the majority of your neurological adaptations and your muscles have gotten as efficient as more or less they can. That's not to say that you're getting bigger as you're an advanced lifter compared to when you're intermediate. No, that's actually slowing down your rate of hypertrophy. But the little hypertrophy you do get is contributing largely to your strength gains because a bigger muscle is a stronger muscle. So of course hypertrophy does contribute to strength. So that clears it up a little bit. Hopefully we understand the relationship, but what does that mean for what you do in the gym? Well, if your goal is to train for hypertrophy, you actually have a lot of avenues available to you. There are studies showing that when you roughly control for volume, high rep training to failure and a low rep training to failure are about equal. However, when you go very high rep or very low rep, there are some issues, okay? When you're doing extremely heavy low rep training, and that's all of your volume, which no one does really, uh, but in studies they've done this, they find that it takes much longer to complete because it takes longer rest periods, and there are complaints of, of more joint injury, more dropouts in studies, and the injury risk is higher because all of your volume is at a higher intensity. On the other end of the spectrum, when you're doing very high rep sets, you have to go to failure to get all the motor units recruited, or a majority of them, or you need to go close to failure because uh, when you're going so light, it's not challenging. Like right now, I'm just moving my arms. To actually hit the point where I had to recruit every single muscle fiber in my arm, I would have to do this all the way to failure. So there are multiple ways to get to uh, hypertrophy. Uh, you can go heavy and pretty much right at the first rep, you're recruiting everything, but then you have to do more sets to get enough volume to actually train all the muscle fibers. Or you can do high rep sets, but you have to go pretty damn near to failure. And you, know, you can imagine doing a, a 30 RM set on squats, there's going to be metabolic issues, you're going to want to throw up, you're going to need to take a really long rest periods. Uh, there are issues with both high rep and low rep training. And there's also considerable debate in the community, uh, the scientific community, as to whether or not uh, very low load training to failure actually, actually effectively trains those high threshold motor units, those um, the, the muscle fibers that typically are only being used when you're doing explosive or very heavy lifting. Um, now, they may get cycled in when you go to failure with low, low loads, but they may not get enough training stimulus. Just like when you're going heavy, you know, only doing a set of three uh, with as heavy a load as you possibly can, while it's recruiting everything so you can actually use the load, there may not be enough time for the slow twitch, slow fatiguing fibers to actually get a training effect. Now, this is not known whether or not there's a difference, because typically in research, we're comparing A versus B, high rep versus low rep. And very rarely do we compare a spectrum uh, of rep ranges against only one. But what little evidence we have suggests that it may be useful uh, to do both high and low rep training to optimize hypertrophy. Now, if you want to train for strength, it's pretty clear. Hypertrophy is important as it's a contributor to strength, but probably more of your time should be spent focusing on those low rep uh, heavier sets because then you're build, building all those other factors that contribute to strength, not just hypertrophy. Uh, you're getting better at the skill of lifting heavy, uh, you're getting um, probably more neurological adaptations, and there's multiple studies showing that while hypertrophy is equated when you match volume, the higher intensity groups typically get more strength. So if your goal is hypertrophy, the take home message is you want to use a spectrum of rep ranges, probably anywhere from say four to 20, and there's a rationale for all of them, with the majority of your time spent in kind of that sweet spot of six to 12, doing some heavier, some lighter work, making sure that you're progressing over time, uh, make sure you watch my video on failure so you're not always training to failure, and that you're really focusing on progressive overload across a spectrum of rep ranges, okay? And if your goal is strength, you kind of want the meat of your training in that, say, one to six range with a, a chunk of time spent above that uh, so that you actually can accumulate volume in a, in a less stressful manner to make sure you're also getting the hypertrophy to support your strength gains. All right, folks, check out the comments below if you want to see all the studies uh, that support what I was saying and where I got this information from and a great article by, by Greg Knuckles. Have a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and I'll see you next time.
Well guys, that is the video. Thank you so much for watching the video. If you like the video, what the hell are you waiting for? You just watched nine minutes of content, approximately. Like the damn video. Leave a comment below what you want to see Eric talk about next. My thanks to Eric for doing this. I'm going to link in the description all of his social media as well. You can check out his books. I highly recommend those. I hope you learned something today. Check back tomorrow for another video. And I'll be seeing all you guys, my rascals, in that next video. Peace. Eat your vegetables. Eat your vegetables. Eat your fucking vegetables.